Welcome to the THP TV original series Lab Rats, where we are going to explore golf shafts and equipment with one of the brilliant minds in the golf industry. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Lab Rats. I'm the director of innovation, Don Brown, and I work at Project X Golf. Before we get started with the series, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've got two degrees in engineering, one in metallurgy and one in composites. Metallurgy at University of Washington, composites at UCSD. I've been working with True Denver for 16 years, all that time working on our graphite golf shafts. Some of the shafts I've designed include the Graphite Blue, Project X, the Hazardous Shaft, and many more shafts yet to come. We're going to take you on a guided tour of our factory and show you some of the things that go into making our shafts and also talk about some interesting topics in the world of graphite shafts today. Hope you enjoy the tour. Come along. Welcome to the first stop on the tour, my office. In addition to being a lab rat, I'm a bit of a pack rat. So as you can see, there's probably right now somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 shafts in this office. This is where everything starts. Here at my desk, I design new shafts that PGA Tour players will be using in the near future. We have an intricate design model that does 200,000 calculations for every change I make the design. Once I'm done with the design, I print it out, and we take it into the lab where the technicians will start the cutting and rolling process. Here we are at our cutting table. This is where we take one of the 25 different prepregs we have and cut it into the different flags we need to make our shaft. Here we cut flags to many different angles, 0, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 60 degrees. Every angle changes the properties of the shaft. We cut flags for the tip section, butt section, and some flags that run the entire length of the shaft. Depending on the layup, we can have up to 10 different kinds of materials in one shaft. Here we are at one of our rolling tables. This is where we roll the carbon fiber prepreg onto the steel mandrels. As you can see from the sign behind me, this is truly part of the handcrafted process. Each flag is rolled onto the steel mandrel by hand. Depending on the shaft, there's anywhere from 7 to 19 flags. Once the flags have been rolled onto the mandrel, we bring them here to our cello taper. What we're doing here is we're putting a high tension cello tape around the shaft. What this does is help squeeze out any air bubbles that may have been incurred during rolling. The tape also shrinks under heat when it goes in the oven, giving even more consolidation to the layer. After we do the cello tape, we cure the shafts in an oven at just a little bit under 300 degrees. We'll roll the whole rack of shafts into the oven for about two hours. Once they're done there, we'll pull them out, move the cello tape in the mandrel, and we'll go on to finishing. Once we're done curing the shaft, we have to remove the steel mandrel that we put inside using this hydraulic mandrel puller. Next, we'll remove the cello tape and then it's on to grinding. When our shafts come out of the oven, they have a slightly resin rich layer on the outside with a ridge in it from the cello tape. We have to grind this off before finishing. Some companies grind up to 25 cycles off their shaft during their processing. This can lead to an inconsistent product. When we do this, we try to only grind off about five cycles. This leads to a much more consistent golf shaft. So this is the paint process. What we do here is we make a pool of paint against a rubber diaphragm we call a squeegee. The shaft is slowly pulled through a hole, leaving a very thin layer of paint on the shaft. After we've cured the paint, we come to our heat transfer machine where we apply the logo to the shaft. A little different than silk screen, this machine can apply all the colors at once instead of each color individually. With the logo applied, the next thing we're going to do is put a clear coat on and this will be ready to ship. If you'd like to come to San Diego and experience everything you just saw, you have a chance. It's called the Handcrafted Experience and we'll be doing it later this summer. You get to live a life in the day of dawn. You get to design your own shaft, help roll it, design the cosmetic, and then the next day you'll get to hit it. So watch out for the signups on THP in the forums later this year. Now that you've seen everything that goes into making one of our shafts, 
here in our handcrafted laboratory. We're going to answer some questions you might have about materials and shaft properties. Okay, Don, we just got done with the tour of your lab. We made a bunch of different stops. How long is the process actually from when the shaft sheet comes out of your computer to when it gets put into somebody's club? Yeah, so usually I put my design sheets in the lab uh, before I leave at the end of the day. So, you know, 4 or 5 o'clock, technicians have already gone home. They're usually in about 5 a.m. If it's an urgent shaft that we really need to get tested, I can have the data on that shaft and it can be ready to hit by about lunchtime. That's not with paint on it or anything, just a raw graphite shaft. Uh, from start to finish to get a new graphic on a shaft, if we're really rushing it, we can get that out in about three days. Oh, that's, that's pretty quick. Yeah, it's a very fast process uh, compared to, you know, our steel shaft manufacturing facility. Uh, they're breakneck speed to get new steel shafts done because there's a lot more steps involved in terms of just the heat treatment processes, which take a day just to do the annealing, and you can't shortcut that process. It can take them, you know, two to three weeks if they're really pushing hard to get a shaft sample out. We can do it here in about 10 hours. That's it's pretty amazing to think that it could get, you know, in 10 hours with such a different technical materials that we're talking about back there. Cutting the materials, rolling them out of the mandrels, putting them in a freezer, or taking them out of the freezer, putting them in the heater. Uh, that's a really quick turnaround. That's quite impressive. When you think about designing a shaft, because we, we saw your office, we saw the different spreadsheets that you have, where do you get the motivation or the inspiration to, to tweak a shaft design from? Is it from watching the guys on tour? Is it from watching the guys uh, you know, down here at Torrey Pines, the everyday golfer out there trying to hit balls, where you need guys that either want to get more height or lower the ball flight? So they're kind of two different design philosophies. For tour players, a lot of time, because they're using the newest equipment out there, we're kind of chasing some of the other equipment. Um, seems every year there's a trend kind of across the board with OEM heads where they're all either a little bit lower spin or different MOIs. And so a lot of times we end up chasing the new heads. Um, last year, for example, with a lot of the new heads, a lot of the guys couldn't turn them over. And that's kind of where Hazardous Red came from. We're out on tour got guys with hazardous black in some of the new equipment and they're all leaving the ball out to the right can't turn it over so hazardous reds design philosophy was take everything that's great about hazardous black but let's soften up the bottom third so the guys can turn the ball over a little bit more we chase the tour golf ball a lot too every year every two years you know the most popular balls on tour the new revisions come out mm -hmm. and that can change a lot of things where a lot of times they're chasing you know more spin with a wedge or more spin with an iron that also usually ends up meaning more spin with the driver, which means now we got to co come up with some shaft technology if the guy's staying in the same driver head to get his spin back where it was, or vice versa. Maybe their new golf ball is not spinning enough, and we've got to get him a new shaft. Um, for the amateur player, it's not as much about chasing the equipment as about what we can do to help amateur golfers, you know, get more club head speed, get more distance, because you know a lot of amateur golfers maybe they have a really negative angle of attack and that's going to spin it more or maybe they're you know swing up on the ball a lot and there's so many different swings you don't can't come up with a shaft that's going to fit all those guys from a spin perspective so what we're really trying to do is maximize ball speed so see things like the pxv 39 uh, at the time it was the lightest shaft available in the u.s market it was a 39 gram shaft that was five degrees of torque so you know still pretty good specs we had maybe two tour players use it but when we designed it we weren't targeting tour players with a 39 gram shaft this was Let's build a very light shaft so amateurs can swing it faster, build it longer, and get more club head speed. Um, the LZ technology was another example of we want to make a shaft that amateur players can load up more, but we don't want it to feel whippy to those guys because that's one of the first things that we'll, a player will reject for. It's like, oh, this feels too whippy. It's too soft for me. I need something stiffer. So the loading zone technology with a really stiff handle but really soft midsection was a concept that came from how can we get the shaft to load more for the amateur without them not liking the way it feels. How do you feel when a, when you hear uh, you know an average golfer come out and say that a shaft is too whippy or or the torque is, is way too high that they can't control it it just doesn't feel right to them but you know the term whippy it, it really is something that gets used quite a bit when really that's not what people are feeling yeah it depends like you know if you've got a guy who you know, hits it off the heel or the toe a lot shafts are going to feel softer that guy because he's introducing a lot of twist into the golf shaft or, or torque. If you watch on a high-speed camera, when someone hits the ball out of the center, the head doesn't twist at all, which is a little counterintuitive because you think about the fact that the ball is hitting off-center an inch and a half from the shaft where the shaft connects to the head, but the ball is going through the center mass for the head, so it's not inducing really much twist. And when you get it out on the toe or weighing on the heel, that's where you're going to see the head twist a lot. That twist in the shaft then translates to, oh, it feels whippy or it feels soft, when in fact the flex may be perfect, they're just feeling the after effects of missing the center of the club face. Um, again, that's kind of torque is the same thing. Guys who hit it out of the heel a lot, even though a lower torque shaft 
or a higher torque shaft will feel better on center strikes, kind of that lower torque when they hit it in the heel or off the toe so the shaft doesn't feel whippy. So a lot of times the, you know, they're diagnosing an issue with a shaft that's really more of an issue with the, the contact from their swing. So what you're saying is it's their swing. It's, it's their problem. It's not really the shaft. I won't it's... say it's always their swing, but, you know, it, you know, you can have an amateur golfer who can't chip or putt, but they can hit out of the center of the driver face every time. Those guys can probably diagnose, hey, you know, I'm, the shaft isn't right for me because I'm hitting out of the center of the face and it feels wrong. But if you've got someone who's over the top and banging the 30 yard, you know, slice every time you off the heel. It's yeah, it's yeah. you. Um, yeah, for you to complain about something <laughs> like that, we have to take with a little bit of a grain of salt. One of my favorite rooms, uh, you know, in your lab is the paint room because I always thought it was this big mystical process of how paint got put on the shaft. Really, as we saw at the tour, it's, it's really low tech. Yeah, it's a very simple process, the squeegee process, and it's something that people have tried to improve upon. People have built robots to try to squeegee the shaft because you have to have someone standing there doing all that individually. Squeegee machines, traditionally in the industry, everyone's chased them. There's people that have had some success with them, but there's not been a revolutionary like we don't ever have to have anybody you know squeegee a shaft again. Um, you can spray shafts. Uh, the T1100 paint is sprayed on. The efficiency ratio of how much paint you get on the shaft versus how much just sprays into the atmosphere and onto the back of the paint booth is way worse than squeezing a shaft. So while it certainly looks low tech, it is the most efficient way possible to paint a golf shaft. And, you know, you're putting on a pretty thin layer when you do that. Our paint layers are about one to two thousandths in thickness. So it's a minimum of weight. It's a minimum of thickness as opposed to a spray process where you can really end up lacquering the paint on. And depending on your sprayer, if he can give it an extra five or six passes that aren't needed, and he ends up putting on two or three grams of paint that when, you know, one gram of paint would do just fine. Final question. Talk about maybe some of the, I don't want to say misconceptions, but things that go on with shaft companies back here in the lab here that people may not really understand. Yeah, I think people, you know, people talk about a lot about either MSI or tons, you know, the shafts are made with 90 ton fiber or it's made with 125 MSI. We get kind of wrapped around those things. And what's important to realize is those, a lot of those shafts aren't made with 100% of that material. For example, if we made a shaft with all 125 MSI or all 90 ton fiber, you'd end up with a shaft at 65 grams that was less than a degree of torque and a 10X from a flex standpoint. And that would also explode the first time you made contact with it. So with all these materials, what we're doing is we're blending materials together. We may be using T1100 in our zero degree plies because it gives us high strength and medium stiffness, but maybe we're using a 46 ton or 40 ton for our torsional plies because that gets our torque number where we want it to be and uh, it gives us a better feel. Maybe we're using some just standard modulus in our tip flags if we're trying to make something that's a little bit higher launching, higher spinning, for example, the hazardous red and the hazardous black. Those designs are almost exactly the same. We're just changing the modulus of the tip flags in those from a 700, T700, which is 33 MSI, to an M40, which is about a 50 MSI. And that's all we're changing, but that dramatically changes the ball flight. So we talk about all these different materials. It's not a shaft is made entirely 100% of even T1100, our, you know, our new hazardous shaft, has got five full wraps of T1100, but mm -hmm. that's only about 50% of the shaft weight. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, Don, thank you for the tour, and we're going to touch on materials at a later episode in Lab Rats. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for tuning in to episode one of Lab Rats with Project X. Future episodes will cover materials, shaft design, and everything else that goes into making golf shafts. Hope you guys enjoyed watching this, and we'll see you again soon.